Thank you. Before I begin, I want to make three notes. Uh, the first is I'd like to thank uh, the English department for hosting this uh, and everyone for attending, friends, students, and colleagues. Um, the second is this is a work in progress, so there will be some questions left unanswered uh, as I develop the project. Uh, and third, uh, I will be using at times a gender neutral pronoun, ZE and ZIR, uh, as to you know, not doing that problem of he, she, she, or him. <clears throat> I will begin this lecture on metafiction by discussing the problematic nature of the term. Like so many terms in literary theory and craft theory, it is reductive and tidy and does not encompass the vast network of thought and implementation of the styles of writing that such an umbrella term stands to signify. In many discussions, the term is tightly tied to postmodernism, which we saw in Dr. Willman's lecture is also a complicated wicker work of ideas crammed into the confines of well-meaning group of syllables. The term metafiction first appeared in 1970 in an article by William H. Gass. This does not mean that metafiction didn't exist until 1970. Obviously, one sees metafictional tendencies as far back as the genesis of the novel. So if we can trace metafiction ten, metafictional tendencies back as far as the earliest works of fiction, where then should I begin my discussion? After all, I only have 45 minutes to discuss this con concept, and I can't possibly cover the history of the novel in that short of time. I just heard undergraduates swallow hard as I said 45 minutes. <clears throat> and what of the problems of metafiction? Is it possible to solve all the problems? No. So what I am aiming to do in this portion of the colloquium is discuss the function of metafiction as a way to move away from the realist modes of novel writing to discuss popular definitions and theories of metafiction using creative works as a means of example and examine the trouble with the revisionist approach to applying the term metafiction to novels written before the First World War. In his essay, Philosophy and the Future of Fiction, Gass writes, and then there is the monster of present day metafictions. These are works which contain one way or the other explanations and references to themselves. They are fictions about fiction. Not in the obvious sense in which one of the characters is a writer, for that can certainly, so, for that can be taken up in traditional form. Rather, metafiction are fictions in which the context of the work being structured is the structure of the tradition fiction. Here, Gass attempts to classify and define a type of fiction that he believes is trying to deal with the question of what is the true form of the modern novel. Though Gass includes authors that we now consider forefathers of metafiction, John Barth and Robert Coover, whom he affectionately calls Bob, he also includes Gertrude Stein and James Joyce. Gass's inclusion of Joyce and Stein are on point, or as my students say, on fleek, <laughs> is, as it is truly the modernist authors who actively sought to problematize the concept of short fiction in the novel as a way to invigorate fiction and shrug free the monolithic constraints of realism to keep the form from suffocating beneath its own weight. Others began disrupting the framework of the story. Mike, Mark Curie writes that the self-referential dimension of literary modernism consisted partly in rejecting the conventions of realism, traditional narrative forms, principles of unity and transparent represental language, and preference for the techniques of alienation, obtrusive, intertextual reference, multiple viewpoints, principles of unity borrowed from myth 
and music and a more demanding, opa opaque, poeticized language. In short, to make the reader implicit in the active construction of meeting in a re writerly connection between author, subject, and reader. This is where we see the ability to link Joyce and Stein into the conversation regarding the concept of self-reflexivity. However, let us move away from our discussion of the origin of metafiction to discuss the common ways in which we see man metafiction manifest. A great deal of this discussion depends on three texts. Linda Hutchins' narcissistic narrative, The Metafictional Paradox, published in 1980. Patricia Waugh's Metafiction, The Theory and Practice of Self-Conscious Fiction, published in 1984. And Linda Hutchins' The Politics of Postmodernism, published in 1989, where she further defines metafictional possibilities that she didn't cover in her first book on the subject. Sadly, not very many books have been written on the subject since. In Narcissistic Narrative, Hutchin relies on Jean Ricardo's auto-representational auto cross from his essay, The Population of Mirrors, Problems and Similarities, based on the text of Alan Robe Goulet. Yes, it would seem that even in discussing auto-representational Writing requires a methodology that appears hopelessly referential, a hall of mirrors endlessly reflecting. However, I'll end the breadcrumb tale with Ricardo. In Ricardo's essay, he seeks to divide a text's external relationships into two areas, similarity and dissimilarity. In his discussion, he seeks to identify popular ideology in fiction, ways authors confront it, in ways authors subvert it. Of the latter, he believes a subversive text will, at every level, contain a second system of understanding that subverts the first, rejecting on a textual level banality of imitation and the uniqueness of reality. He then presents the reader with his cross. Isn't it majestic? Ricardi's cross of auto-representation flows as follows. On the left, there is the auto-representation vertical and descending, which he calls expressive. Here, the story is subservient to the story, which is where one would locate realism. This notion of realism does not include the postmodern practices of dirty realism, though which is more subjective mode of writing, filtering the real world through the thoughts and emotions of the characters. The cross moves then to auto-representation, horizontal and referential, which is productive. Once the cross begins its ascent to auto-representation, vertical and ascending, and auto-representation, horizontal and literal, one sees that the story becomes subservient to the writing. If it is Ricardo's argument that the similarity leads to impressions of representation. And thus, two readings are possible. Duplication leads towards auto-representation insofar as fiction has both a literal and a referential dimension. The problem Ricardo sees is that a reader can choose one orientation over the other, therefore becoming strictly ideological. He writes, those who think in terms of expression will emphasize the impact of the referential dimension. Those who think in terms of production will stress that of the literal dimension. Certainly, an author can lead a reader to knowledge, but Z cannot make a reader think. This is the point where metafiction functions as a revolutionary force in writing as it aims to create a story that engages a reader in a way that requires their to use their active intelligence. <laughs>
in her definition of metafiction, or what she calls the narcissistic narrative, there, ex uh, there exists a narrative that is flaunting, bearing its fictional and linguistic systems to the reader's view, transforming the process of making of poesis into part of the shared pleasure of reading. Hutchin uses Ricardo's type, uh, topological and theoretical cross as a foundation, but she alters it by redefining the quadrants to categorize metafictional modes. She lists three issues with Ricardo's cross. The first is, it doesn't provide discussion of works that are self-conscious or linguistically self-reflexive. I skipped one. Uh, Ricardo's list is auto-representational. Work is limited to alliteration. And the third, his approach is entirely a priori. Hutchin believes Ricardo's cross functions as a pleasantly structured triangle of types. In her metafictional cross, Hutchins considers texts that are diegetically self-aware, meaning that they are conscious of their own narrative processes, as well as work that is self-reflexive, aware of both the limits and powers of their own language. In the one, the texts present themselves as digest, as narrative. In the second, they present unobfuscated text as language. She therefore further breaks down the categories into two modes, overt and covert metafiction. The overt forms are texts that are self-conscious and present and present self-reflection that is clearly evident. These texts are thematized and allegorized within their fiction. The covert forms are structuralized, internalized, and actualized as the text may be self-reflective but not self-conscious. We are still left with a four-part system. However, now the overt, diegetic, and linguistic types of literary narcissism and their covert counterparts, diegetic and linguistic, are included. In order to see the diachronic and synchronic implications, we have to examine each mode. The first is more concise than is the second. Hutchins considers overt metafiction a fiction that takes shape of an explicit thematization, thematization through plot allegory, narrative metaphor, or natural commentary. Hutchin points out that it is not so much a rupture as it is a slow maturation, claiming that the contemporary self-awareness is a text of jouissance, a tradition that we can see developing in texts as early as Don Quixote. Self-aware parody defamiliarizes the reader. Z recognizes the framework, tropes, and language of the story, but the author requires Z to engage with the text critically because the literary devices have been laid so bare. As Patricia Waugh writes, parody renews the literary devices, sorry, parody renews and maintains the relationship between form and what it can express by upsetting a previous balance which has become so rigidified that conventions of the form can only express a limited or even irrelevant content. My first example of narcissistic parody occurs in Robert Coover's The Romance of the Fat Man, or I'm sorry, The Romance of the Thin Man and the Fat Lady, where Coover parodies love stories to show that not even love escapes the matrix of capitalism. Coover's, Coover begins the story by setting up the reader's expectation. Now, Many stories have been told, songs sung, about the thin man and the fat lady. Not only is there something comic in the coupling, but the tall, erect, and bony stature of the man and the cloven mass of rosette flesh that is the lady are themselves metaphors too apparent to be missed. To be sure of it, one need only try to imagine a thin lady paired with a fat man. It is not ludicrous. It's unpleasant. No, the much recounted mating of the thin man 
and the fat lady is a circus legend full of truth. Writing that the legend is full of truth indicates that the story should progress as traditionally told. However, what is also apparent in this introduction is the evidence that Coover intends on deviating from the norm. As he asks the reader to reconsider the binary state of the characters. If perhaps Coover had ended the paragraph with a contrary statement, the reader would be more prone to anticipate the turn. But Coover does not end with this. Rather, he ends by reaffirming the truth of the traditional tale. As the story unfolds, the thin man and the fat lady lead a, revol uh, lead a revolt against the ringmaster. The thin man gains muscle mass and the fat lady drops weight. And soon the circus loses its popularity. As a result, the lovers quarrel and eventually separate as part of a trade to make more money. Coover sit sets the anticipation to his advantage in order to subvert that expecta expectation that love does indeed conquer all. In another story, Coover writes the tale of Noah's Ark. The story, entitled The Brother, is the biblical tale that he presents through the perspective of Noah's brother. In this rewrite, the protagonist, against his wife's will and his own better judgment, helps his brother construct the ark. When the rains begin to fall, Noah refuses to let his brother and sister-in-law board the ark. Contrary to the biblical tale, when Noah builds the ark against all odds, Coover's stories depict Noah as a lazy and heartless man who forsakes his own family. Through the rewriting of Noah's Ark, Coover questions the validity of history. As Patricia Waugh argues, such stories suggest that history itself is a multiplicity of alternative worlds, as, as fictional as but other than the worlds of novels. It creates a dialogue between the text and the reader as it, as it asks the readers to reinterpret what Z has taken for granted. Perhaps we can see parody best exemplified in genre fiction, which is so popular because it provides a very consistent framework. Certainly the content of these genre stories shift, but reader expectations are met through the tropes and structure of the book. So for example, when you go see a Star Wars movie, you pretty much know what you're getting. The detective story, for example, has endured a very long period of popularity. In the detective novel, the reader is presented with a unique but often flawed detective character that usually possesses skill and intelligence that is unsurpassed by those who surround him. The one exception to this is the antagonist or criminal in the story who must be equally as intelligent as the detective. Clues are left for the reader, but they are usually clues that don't appear significant. In fact, the author works to provide false clues to the reader in order to mislead Zir, so that in the end, when the detective defeats his foe, the reader will recognize the detective's genius as he was able to connect the puzzle pieces that the reader neglected to assemble. However, arguably, one of the most recognizable elements of the detective novel is in its language, which is usually gritty and hard-boiled. The prose is short and tight, only expanding during moments of necessary description. I've selected the detective novel as the example of genre fiction, as it occurs to me that it's one of the most parodied genres in the latter part of the 20th century. If we look at Paul Auster's City of Glass, for example, we can see the way in which he affirms reader expectations through language. Auster writes, I'm compelled to say this in like old timey voice. It was a wrong number that started it. The telephone ringing three times in the dead of night and the voice on the other end asking for someone he was not. <laughs> 
The tone of it aligns neatly with several genre markers. It's hard-edged, dark, and mysterious. However, Oster quickly subverts expectations as the protagonist, Quinn, is an author of mystery novels. He, like the typical detective, is down on his luck, but very clearly not a detective. He's not even a brilliant specialist used by the law to solve mysteries. He is simply a writer who is experiencing backward slide in his career and who decides to engage in the mystery. Oster writes, like most people, Quinn knew almost nothing about crime. He had never murdered anyone. He had never stolen anything. And he did not know anyone who had. He had never been inside a police station, had never met a private detective, had never spoken to a criminal. Whatever he knew about these things, he had learned from books, films, and newspapers. The man on the other end of the line calls again, asking for Paul Oster, who Quinn is not. Quinn decides to meet with the caller and take the job, rather than explore the world. Rather than explore the world of crime, City of Glass explores semiotics, symbolic order, and the structure of the detective novel, exploiting the similarities and differences of the form. City of Glass is a unique example as it exists both in the categories of overt and covert metafiction. The covert mode is slightly more diverse in its approach as the form contains several techniques that fit, neat, that fit into Ricardo's category of auto-representation, horizontal, and referential productive. Everybody got that? As we see in the previous example, the man on the phone asked Quinn for Paul Oster. By placing himself in the story, Oster has breached the traditional framework of the novel, thus destroying any anticipation of a realist text. Both modernist and postmodernist writers have problematized traditional framing. Patricia Waugh argues that the contemporary metafiction foregrounds framing as a problem. Examining frame procedures in the construction of the real world and novels. The concept of frame includes Chinese box structures, which contest the reality of each individual box through a nesting of narrators and multiple beginnings and multiple endings. Although Robert Coover's The Magic Poker and Flan O'Brien's At Swim Two Birds deal with frame framing in two different ways, they are both overt actualized linguistic models of metafiction as they are explicitly aware of their status as literary artifacts and of the necessary presence of the reader. In The Magic Poker, Coover, as narrator and creator, takes on the role of set designer, exposing the artifice of writing it is as if it, it's, it's as if the reader is backstage with Coover as he explains how he set the stage. Coover writes, I arrange the guest cabin. I rot the porch and tatter the screen door and infest the walls. I tear out light switches, gut the mattresses, smash the windows, and shit on the bathroom floor. I rust the pipes, kick in the papered walls, unhinge doors. Really, there's nothing to it. In fact, it's a pleasure. The characters in the story explore the island, but the narrative is interrupted consistently by the author, who, writes, who rewrites paragraphs with different outcomes, changes characters' clothing, and retracts previously asserted facts. The world is very unstable. Flan O'Brien takes on a different approach to frame breaking in his novel, at Swim Two Birds, where the reader is presented with several interacting stories. The story of the author, the story of the author writing a novel about an author writing a novel, the story of the characters in the fictional author's book acting against his will while he sleeps. This novel, which often feels as if O'Brien has trapped the reader inside a hall of mirrors, consistently reflects upon itself. 
By exposing the frame of their stories, both Coover and O'Brien are requiring their readers to be active. The reader is explicitly or implicitly forced to face his responsibility towards the text, that is, towards the novelistic world he is creating through the accumulation, accumulated fictive reference of literary fiction. As the novelist actualizes the world of his imagination through words, the reader, from those same words, manufactures in reverse a literary universe that is much his own creation as it is the narrator's. This near equation of acts of reading and writing is one of the concerns that sets modern metafiction apart from previous novelistic self-consciousness. My mouth has never felt so dry. Realist novels tend to resolve contradictions to ensure continuity, a seemingly dysgenic act insofar as it encourages a pattern of inactive thinking. Metafiction, however, often contains contradictions which imply simultaneity. For example, stories that contain multiple beginnings or endings require the reader to consider the nature of storytelling. In At Swim, Two Birds, Flann O'Brien begins the novel with several different beginnings. This introduction, although later tying into Chinese box storyline, requests that the reader think about the possibility of choices of the author that the author has in beginning the tale. One beginning and one ending for a book was a thing I did not agree with. A good book may have three openings entirely dissimilar and interrelated only in the presence of the author, or for that matter, 100 times as many endings. Another example is in The Confederate General from Big Sur by Richard Brodigan, where he uses a similar approach. However, he exposes the po possibility of multiple endings. 186,000 endings per second. Then there are more and more endings. The 6th, the 53rd, the 131st, the 9,435th ending. Endings going faster and faster, more and more endings, faster and faster until the book is having 186,000 endings per second. I should note, though, that this multiple beginnings is not entirely a postmodern or modernist approach. In fact, the Tanakh has two creation stories at the beginning of it. Within the covert metafictional category, we also find work that plays with language. For example, both Robert Coover's Panel Game and James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake are covertly linguistic, which directs the focus of the reader to the semantic duplicity of the language itself. In Panel Game, Coover creates an ambiguous game where the protagonist, in, this case of, in the case of this story, which is narrated from the second point of view, the reader, is isolated from the other contestants, audience and moderator, as they play with words. Coover writes, scoot, scoot, but what? Scales, shield, bone or horn? Scut is a tail and a paw is, pad is a paw? An animal, yes, but crimson, why not just red? Because crimson comes from Kermis insect, but more. Dried female insect bodies, shimmy, chemise, or a shimmer of lights. But pad is stuff. Females, female bellies, dried and stuffed. Dried and stuffed. It's possible. Stickle, stick, stitch, a poem here. That's obvious. And some animal, light and dogberry from. One can see the mental process as the protagonist slash reader attempts to figure out the linguistic code of this game show. Just as a noose descends 
and wraps around the protagonist slash reader's throat. Z decodes the riddle and relives to, say, to see another day. Joyce's approach to linguistic play is similar, but much more complex. In Finnegan's Wake, Joyce creates a text so multi-layered that many people consider it unreadable. The troublesome phonetic construction of the novel, uh, such as Jellius Caesar instead of Julius Caesar, is an emphasis on the arbitrary associations of sound, rhyme, and image. Attention is drawn to the formal organization of words and away from their referential potential. Joyce requires his reader to be active, to participate in the story, asking Zier to research, to read out loud, and return to the text and uncover more riddles and hidden meanings. The reader is no longer allowed to sit comfortably and follow the narrative as Z might have done with Joyce's earlier works, such as Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. But Z must spend countless hours combing over the book to satiate the hunger of curiosity, oftentimes developing conclusions independent of anything Joyce may have intended. Of Joyce's novel, Linda Hutchins writes, Joyce foregr Joyce's foregrounding of language in Finnegan's Wake is perhaps, perhaps the real forebearer of the nouveau, nouveau romancer's creation of fiction. In the space between words, in the early Rousseau, language begets language, which begets a versus-similar narrative. Fiction, language, begets language, which is fiction. The difficulty in reading these texts bears witness to the increased demands made on the reader. Another covert metafictional aspect of Finnegan's Wake is Joyce's use of footnotes. The paratextual elements of the novel, the footnotes, asides, and musical scores, which in normal context would offer further information, such as translations, commentary, or illustrations, create secondary storylines. So we read here, whom will come over? Who do caps ever? And how less do we hook our hike to find that pint of Porter Place? Am shot, says the bigger. Then there's a footnote. The footnote below would read, Raw mesh quoche with her garlic tinge. <laughs> if only Harad with the Cromwell's eczema was to go for me like he does snuffler, whatever about his blue canaries, I'd do nine months for his beaver beard. The reader might expect to find information here that legitimizes the text or adds information, but finds instead that the footnote has little to do with the previous storyline. The reader must reconsider the value of the footnote, which points to the artificiality of the text, to the structure system that the reader has come to know through zero reading experiences. Paratextual experimentation is a practice that Linda Hutchin discusses in her discur as discursive in her book, The Politics of Postmodernism, writing that the reader's linear reading is disrupted by the presence of lower text on the same page. And this hermeneutic disruption calls attention to the footnote's own very doubled or dialogic form. Flan O'Brien also uses paratext in his novel, The Third Policeman, where the protagonist discusses theories and counter theories of a strange scientist named DeSelby. As the story progresses, the theories of DeSelby become more and more absurd, and one realizes that he is not a real scientist at all, but a fictional character. One of the footnotes reads as follows. 
Darkness was simply an accretion of black air, i.e. a staining of the atmosphere due to volcanic eruptions, too fine to be seen with the naked eye, and also to certain regrettable industrial activities involving coal tar. The absurdity of this quote undermines the authority that the footnote usually possesses. Hutchin discusses this approach in politics of postmodernism when she writes, historiographic metafiction uses the paratextual conventions of historiography, especially footnotes, to both inscribe and undermine the authority and objectivity of historical sources and explanations. But I was an undergrad once, and I, I know that a lot of undergrads just don't read the footnotes. Well, I didn't. Now that, I'm co now that I've covered several of the common modes of metafiction, I feel it's most important to discuss what I see as a problem in liter literary analysis. The tendency to reclaim previous fictions to fit a publishing agenda. In his introduction to metafiction, Mark Curie touches on the subject when he writes, postmodern retrospect produces a spurious, self-historicizing teleology, which confirms that critical texts construe their literary objects according to their own interests and proposes postmodern discourses are seen as the endpoint of history and all prior discourse are constructed as leading an exolibri towards the postmodern. <clears throat> in reading articles and books on metafiction, we see the tendency of the authors to retroactively categorize works as metafictional. However, we cannot, degree, we cannot with any degree of absolute certainty claim that an author was intentionally creating work with the intention of problematizing form and the relationship of the reader to the text. This is why I propose dividing works into two categories, writing that is metafiction and writing that has metafictional tendencies. Much of the writing that occurs before the 20th century, where we see elements of metafiction manifest in, and that, excuse me, much of the writing that occurs before the 20th century, where we see elements of metafiction manifest and that postmodern critics reclaim as metafiction will fall into the former category. Whereas self-conscious writing in the 20th century and beyond may fall into the latter. Metafiction is an author's active attempt to problematize the reader's relationship to the text in order to generate a new dialogue, to require the reader to participate in the construction of the text. And this is where I tap out because I'm still working on this problem and getting ready to categorize these texts on another cross. <clears throat> 